So where are you from, Tamika? I am, that's a complicated question, believe it or not. I'm a military brat, which means my dad was in the army. And so I was born at a, on a military base in America in uh, a state called Oklahoma on a base called Fort Sill. Uh, I was born there, but I only lived there for a couple of years. And then I like to say I began my, my world tour because I, I'm from there, literally, meaning I was born there, but I didn't grow up there. And where do you live? What, where are some of the places you've lived? I have lived at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is where, where I was born, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, West Point, New York, Brooklyn, New York, um, Woodbridge, Virginia, uh, Manhattan, Kansas, Aschaffensburg, Germany, Würzburg, Germany, um, Fort Ord, Kansas, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. I've lived literally in about 10 different places throughout my life. So some in the United States and some internationally. Your international life sounds like it's been in Germany? Yes. Okay, any place else you've lived internationally? Uh, no. That's okay, it. but I know you're an avid traveler. Yes. So why don't you tell, me, tell us a little bit about a few places where you've traveled, <laughs> since we're talking about places. Sure. Um, I have traveled to close to 40 countries. Um, including Brazil, Cuba, South Africa, Ethiopia, yeah. <laughs> um, Morocco, um, England, France, Belgium. Um, mm -hmm. I just I can't remember every every place, <laughs> but uh, and yeah. where do you live now? Right now I live in uh, the, a suburb of Washington D.C., um, about twenty five minutes from the, uh, the American capital on the Virginia side. That's where I live. And where did you live before that? I lived for close to 20 years in Brooklyn, New York, um, which is the favorite place I've lived. Mm -hmm. um, it's where I identify with the most. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious a little bit about your family life. So you can, can you tell us a little bit about your family of origin or your birth family and um, who you grew up with and moved around the United States? I have a father and mother and three brothers. I'm the eldest, oldest child. I'm the only girl, which means I was very bossy. Um, I, and um, so that's my family of origin. And then I'm a mother. I have uh, one son. He is two. And it's he and I. And so tell us a little bit about that. So you relocated from New York to Virginia. I know that it was related to being a new mom. So tell us a little bit about that. And so um, my family, my parents, they live in Virginia and they are both retired. They have worked, and my dad worked in the army for 20 some odd years. And then he became uh, a high school, or a uh, middle school principal. And my mother was uh, a middle school teacher for about 20 years. And they both retired um, over the course of the past two years. And so I said, hey, I'm coming with my baby. You take care of him. <laughs> um, not really, but they really do take care of him. They take care of us. They uh, are very supportive of us. And the only reason I feel comfortable leaving my child on the other side of the world is because my parents are taking such good care of him. And so I lived in New York. I love New York. But you know, when you have a small child, especially when you're a single parent, the most important thing for me is to make sure he's well taken care of. So that's why I made, I made my move. Mm -hmm. And how old is he? And what is his name? His name, his name, well, first, his name, uh, I guess, in, is Soliman. <laughs> Soliman, but I call him Solomon. So the English version is Solomon, but here I would think his name would be referred to as Soliman. Um, and he is two years old. He's two and he's very active and just, the love of my life. So you can see how brave and courageous Tamika is moving, being a mom, being all the way on the other side of the planet away from her two-year-old. So um, she's a, a, a very amazing and brave woman. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've... Uh, no, let me, before I ask you that, have you always wanted to be a journalist? I have always wanted to be a writer. Um, since I was a little girl, I used to write. In fact, I, before I was a, I wanted to be a writer, I was just a, an avid reader. Um, whatever I could get my hands on, I would read. 
and the reading is what inspired the writing. And uh, so from small, since I was in elementary school, I either wanted to be, I really only wanted to be a writer. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer and I was like, hmm. So I, what I wanted to do, uh, one out, and it usually always does. Okay, yeah. So um, tomorrow I wanna explore that part of your story more, how you went from being somebody who knew they wanted to be a writer, but in a family where your parents wanted you to be a lawyer and how what you wanted to do one out. So we're gonna explore that tomorrow, some more tomorrow. Um, in between now and then, can you just tell us a few places that you've worked, some of the kinds of jobs that you have, have had a little bit about your career pr progression so we know your areas of expertise and a little bit about your process, like how you got, what landed you here? What was the process that brings you here today? That journey. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. To make a long story short, very long story short, I have been a journalist, writer, producer for... When you say producer, what do you mean? So uh, I do, I have worked in magazines, newspapers, and television throughout the course of my uh, close to 20 years. Um, I have produced, uh, meaning I have done producing for television shows, um, what's called field producing, which is when you go and you take a microphone and you, you know, put it in someone's face and you have them tell their story, um, do interviews that are recorded on camera. So that's part of what I do, what, what I say, what I've done producing. Um, another kind of producing I have done is um, helping to produce events. So what that looks like is uh, there will be um, an objective to have an event and I will help to put it together from the beginning to the end, from the time that people come into the room to the time that they leave. You know, what are we gonna cover? What's gonna be in the background? Who's gonna participate? Where are they going to sit? You know, what is going to be the decorations? Um, that's another kind of production. Another kind of production I have done is web, web production or internet production. So, you know, the stories you go and see on the, on the websites, um, producing that entails uh, not only just the text, but the images the titles, it's the technical side of uh, putting together a story on the internet. So that when you click on something, you go into another story, for instance, that's related to the story that you're reading about. Or if you're going to look at a slideshow, which is a bunch of pictures that accompany the story, a web producer does that. That's what I've done. And part of the reason I asked you what it meant to be a producer is because some of us have had a conversation about this word editor, like in, in what media is the person who you would work with um, an editor and what in what media is it a producer? So it sounds like in television and also in film, you might be working with a producer and sometimes that producer does some editing like functions. Um, in print, in, mag in, in newspapers, in magazines, and that kind of thing, we might call that person more of an editor. And so I, also, I also do editing. So someone will, you know, you guys will turn in stories to me, and I will do exactly what Hillary um, did with the story, which is tighten it up, ask you questions if I don't understand something, um, have you go back and, and talk to someone again to get questions uh, answered that perhaps weren't answered during the first interview. That's the point of an editor, to make sure that the story fits within the space of the newspaper or the magazine that's been allotted for that story, to make sure that you don't go too long with your story. If we say 350 words, that's exactly what we mean. That's what an editor does. Um, another part of my job is working as a, a, a communication strategist consultant for the federal government in the US. So I work on a, um, a campaign that is underneath the Department of Health and Human Services um, around helping to uh, help kids live their healthiest lives. And that is helping them to avoid contracting STDs, including HIV. So one of the, one of the roles- STDs means? Uh, uh, sexually transmitted diseases or STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Um, so it's helping to create opportunities for kids to learn how to protect themselves um, and how to um, prepare themselves to live their lives as adults in a way that's gonna help them throughout the trajectory of their lives. So one of the ways I do that is I help the federal government, government and tell me if I'm talking too fast, I'm sorry, um, find people 
that will help to uh, share the message in a way that kids can relate to. So everyone knows who Chris Brown is, right? Oh, yes, we had a lovely conversation about Chris Brown the other day. Right. The conversation was about how, whether Chris Brown's life is characteristic of many young people's lives. And so the part of the conversation we had was about the difference between the perception that the American media puts forth that a lot of people have a life like that and the reality of, do you know anybody with many people with a life like Chris Brown? Uh, no. <laughs> Not in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're actually... Um, but so he's a bad example, but it's fine. No, it's a perfect example because we had a long conversation about this the other day. So I'm glad you mentioned this. Thing. What I mean is uh, in terms of finding celebrities who can carry the message of uh, STD prevention or um, living a healthy life. So I, I, one of my jobs is to come up with, uh, to find celebrities to bring to the U.S. government who can potentially help them do what's called a PSA, which is a public service announcement which is video where they're talking to kids and it's broadcast over the internet or television. It's to interview celebrities who are maybe role models in a way to create content for the website. So if I put an interview up on say Beyonce, you know, who is telling kids that you don't have to, that, you know, you should have safe sex or something to that effect. It's a little story put on a website, kids read it. You know, they're more inclined to pay attention than if an adult is telling them. Um, so that, those are some of the ways. And then I also advise the government on what are the best avenues to reach kids. What are they reading? How are they reading it? How are they consuming their information? Are they on Twitter? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Keek? It's also telling them which media outlets are kids reading. Are they reading blogs? Are they watching BET? Where should you focus most of your attention? So these are all aspects of the kind of work that I do. Yeah. So she's very impressive. Tamika, do you work for somebody else or do you work for yourself? I work for myself. Okay. So a lot of you have been interested in how a journalist pieces their living together. Tamika will be another really wonderful example. She's done, she does different things than what I do, different things than what Robert does. We overlap, but she's giving you some more things to think about in terms of um, putting your career together and or your business together. And then I also wanted to ask you, can you name a couple of organizations or a couple of outlets that you have worked for or that you work with? Sure. MTV. CNN. Can you explain what, do you guys know what MTV is? Okay, sorry. MTV, <laughs> CNN, um, Essence, which is where I got my start. I don't, if you guys heard of Essence magazine? Yeah. yeah. Essence is really cool because they're actually just launching in South Africa, the Essence Music Festival um, this next year. So it's been a, mostly a U.S. Uh, publication uh, for black women. But now they're going internationally, and I'm excited that they're coming to the continent and starting in South Africa. So hopefully you'll see more. New York Magazine. Um, it, it's been so many uh, over the years. And that's part of the joy of being a journalist is, uh, I think, is just kind of pursuing where you have an interest in writing for or working for and, um, and just trying to get in, you know, and, and do work for them. Uh, so I come from a military family. I wasn't in the army, but my father was. And so he um, was one of the first black men um, to um, hold certain positions in the US military and to graduate from the, uh, one of the most prestigious schools uh, called West Point um, for, in his era, it was like 1974. So he really wanted his children to also go to that school. And I have three brothers. One of them went to that school and another one went to another military academy. Because I am firstborn, there was a, a lot of uh, pressure for me to also go to that school. And it did not get any easier when I got into that school um, because it would be uh, fully paid for. Um, and I never wanted to go. But as a kid, I always have been pretty, um, I like to do things my way, uh, strong-willed. And I think that was something that I was born with, but I also learned, ironically, by watching my dad. You know, he's a military man, yes sir, no sir, um, you know, 
with his way or no way. And really, he role modeled that for his daughter, much to his dis uh, dismay, probably. But um, I said no. And I had to pay for some of my own education to go to college. My parents had offered me um, some help, some you know, financial incentives to uh, go the course of being, becoming a soldier. And um, I just always wanted to be a writer. And so they were upset with me at first. Um, it was clear that they were not happy. I kind of, I wouldn't say I got punished, but the things that they offered to my brothers, they did not offer me. And um, I could have been upset about that. It, it didn't feel good. It doesn't feel good necessarily to go your own way when, you, when your family wants something different for you. But I believe that you have one life to live. And I believe that what you do with your life is your responsibility. And I believe that if you don't have your family support, you find a new family. Which is not to say that you don't love the people that you were born to. It just means that in your journey as a person, as a journalist, as whatever it is you end up being, you find like-minded people that will give you support. And it, so it took some courage for me to decide to do my own thing. But I remember years after I decided to become a journalist and I was experiencing some success with it. My father had off, my parents had offered to buy, um, buy me a car because the cost of the education that I was getting was so much more than the car. So they, that was like their, one of their things to bribe me into becoming a soldier. And um, so I didn't take the car. I went to work for myself and I bought my own car. And it took a lot of time and it was all the money I had, but I believed that this is what my purpose is. And so um, years later, my father came to me and he said he was very proud of me. And he bought me a laptop to show his support. And it was his way of saying, I'm sorry. Um, it was his way of saying, um, you be who you wanna be. And we love you and we support you. And sometimes the story ends that way and sometimes it doesn't. But I really believe for you to um, experience your, your own purpose and your own joy in life, you have to do things that are gonna work out best for you. I was curious from very young and I just love to read and I love to write. And um, I started writing like poetry and small stories when I was in elementary school. And my teachers would pull me aside and say, you have talent. And I remember writing something, it was a poem. And because my dad was in the army, we were living in Germany. Um, I don't know how it happened, but someone, they end up um, taking my poem and putting it in a um, magazine and distributing it uh, throughout the Department of Defense, which is throughout the world, as a, student, as a, as a girl. Um, and that had a powerful effect on me. It said, since a little girl, I have talent. And people recognize that. And I, as a little girl, you know, it's like sometimes difficult for you to see in yourself what other people see. So it was very motivating for me to continue doing it. Um, and so... That was the beginning of my journey to say, I'm going to do this, no matter what anyone says. And uh, so I'm, glad, I'm obviously glad that I did. <laughs> and so... Did you guys see me tearing up too? You know I'm the crybaby, right? <laughs> it's a beautiful story. You see why I love her too? Um, and so your intentions as a journalism, what are your intentions as a journalist? Um... Right now, my intention as a journalist now is to give voice to people of color so that we can begin to change the narrative that's being told about us, um, especially women, um, but all of us. I'm the mother of a son, so I love everyone and support everyone. But I know what it's been like for me as a woman um, to, uh, you know, follow my dream. And so now it is to help to um, 
provide opportunities for other people to hear their own voices and encourage them. Um, it is also to write stories about us from our perspective and not other people's perspectives. It is to educate us about important issues happening in our communities um, in a way that's affirming and loving and not like this. Um, it's, it's, it is also to give people the opportunity to tell their stories because a lot of times they don't have that opportunity. No one listens. They don't feel like they can share. Um, I mean, working with Hillary has been really great because there's a publication that we work on um, uh, called uh, it's through the Black AIDS Institute. What's the like Black AIDS Weekly? It's a weekly electronic newsletter. Thank you, uh, Black AIDS Weekly. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been able to interview people who have such um, they have stories that are pouring out of them. And really, they want to share, and they have not really shared before. And it's, I consider it to be an honor to be able to help them tell their stories. So that is one of my main motivations as a journalist now. In the beginning, I'll be honest, I just loved to write, and it was an opportunity to do more of what I love. When I first started in journalism, I was a hip-hop writer. So my favorite magazine at the time was called Vibe. Has anyone heard of Vibe before? Vibe magazine? It was in New York. I was like, that's my favorite magazine of all time. This was like when Jay-Z was first blowing up. You know, it was like 50 Cent. You know, it was like really, really cool opportunities to meet rappers and interview rappers and producers and that sort of thing. So initially, I got into journalism uh, through writing for Vibe. So it was music writing. And that was just... It was cool. It was fun, you know? As I've gotten older and I've cared a little bit less about the entertainment and more about what's happening in the world, my trajectory as a journalist has changed. So, I, you know, not to say that entertainment and rap and everything is not cool, it's not fun, but, you know, what I really want to know is, like, how are we doing as, as, as uh, people around education? You know, how are we doing as a people around our health care? How are we doing as the people around our politics? So that's the beauty, that's a beautiful thing about journalism. You can start off in one area covering one thing and then let your curiosity take you wherever you want to go. Um, and so in the beginning, it was kind of like, yeah, I just want to have a good time. And then I realized the power of journalism and the power of your voice. And I started to use it in a different way. Now that's an answer, right? <laughs> I was doing celebrity journalism, and then when my brother went to war in Afghanistan, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something more serious. And that is a great example of what I just was talking about in terms of um, now having the tools that I have been able to hone in celebrity journalism that I could transfer to another area. So at the time that I moved out of celebrity journalism, I had been working at BET as a show writer for a couple of years. Um, and when you say show writer, can you explain what you mean and also what BET is? Sure. So BET is Black Entertainment Television. Uh, do you guys have, have access to it here in Ethiopia? Okay. Oh, that's my second. I asked them if they knew what MTV was. They were like, yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, BET, I was so, so I used to write a half hour TV show. And the premise of the TV show was to interview different celebrities every week. It was kind of like the equivalent of a news magazine. You know, you bring on Rihanna, you interview Rihanna, and she tells you, you know, top five fashion picks for, you know, the month of whatever. You bring on 50 Cent, and he takes you into the studio, and he plays some music for you. So my job was to write that show. It was to write scripts for the artists, to interview the artists. Um, it would be to um, go into the studio for like live tapings of the shows with the host of the show, sit at the booth, you know, and then just basically help them uh, throughout, write the whole show, basically. And I, I had, uh, that was what I was doing when my brother went to war. My brother ended up going to West Point. And so he went to Afghanistan. And I was, I was like, I'm good on 50 Cent. It's cool. 
but I really want to know more about how I can use my um, training to talk about what's happening in the world. So from BET, I went to Fox News, um, where I started doing hard news. So I, I and so will you tell us what Fox News is? Sure. So Fox News is one of the it's one of the largest um, cable channels in the United States. Um, Fox News Channel, I should say. It's very political, and it's uh, it's got some interesting connotations <laughs> to it if you are African American. But that's a whole other conversation. I worked for a division of Fox News that was. So it's kind of like the, so I work for a division that's kind of like the Associated Press. Are you familiar with the Associated Press? Yeah, Robert talked to us about that. Great. So it's like, um, it's a news service, it's a wire service. Um, what I used to do would be write national and international scripts for anchors at affiliate Fox stations around the country. So, um, around the country as in the United States. So if I'm covering the mudsli a mudslide in Bolivia, for instance, or I'm covering the election of Barack Obama, um, I would write scripts for the anchors who would go on air in their respective markets throughout the country. Um, so that's the transition I made, which was pretty severe, <laughs> going from you know partying and sort of like hip hop to like writing about a plane crash. But because I had honed my skills at BET as a producer, and as a writer, um, I was able to take what I had learned and apply it in another area, which is the whole point, I think, of continuing to grow as a journalist and utilizing whatever you can you do in one area and taking it to another area. One of the things that Hillary and I have talked about, and also I've talked about with other journalists, is once you have some basic tenets of storytelling, you can, tell, you can tell stories in any kind of way you want. I started off as strictly a print journalist. And then I worked, uh, so magazines. And then I learned a little bit about television and got a job in television. And then I learned about the web and got a job in the web. But it was essentially still the basics of learning how to tell a story. You know, what Teller is showing us now you know, how to grab the reader's attention, how to hold it, how to tell a story in a way that people are captivated and they want to know more and will read the whole thing. Because really it's the same in television and in the web. It's just told in different formats. Um, some of the challenges that I faced uh, are being only given the stories about other women to write about. You know, that's one thing in hip hop, I, you know, they used to piss me off to be honest, I don't just want to write about, you know, the woman who's doing something, which is, I, I totally do want to write about her, but I also want to be able to have an opportunity to write about the men. I can do just as good of a job as men. So that would be something that I did not like, and I would have to be like, hey, I'm great at this, but I also want to do this. And I feel like when you do that, people take you seriously, and they also respect you. And so how I was able to overcome that challenge is to stand up for myself and speak my mind. When I didn't like something, it was on me to say, and not to be combative, not to be difficult. Sometimes you win just by smiling and saying, you know, the next time I'd really like to talk to little Wayne. I got some things I want to ask him, you know, and people generally sometimes because they, they're not necessarily thinking that maybe you have an interest in it. And you let them know that you do. And then you have more opportunities handed to you. Um, I would say also, always, sometimes always being asked to write about the black issues. Um, as a woman, that is something that is not necessarily rela you know, just related to women, but like one of the ways in which I have felt uh, put into a box um, and that, Solving that problem uh, has been similar in terms of saying, I have an interest in doing something else in addition to it. Uh, what did I do to develop myself as a person as, and as a journalist? Um, I'd say one of the best things that I've ever done is surround myself with people who love me and support me. 
Um, one of the best things I think I've ever done to develop myself as a person and as a journalist is to also surround myself with people I think are smarter than me. Because mm -hmm. iron sharpens iron. Um, people who have taken interest in you and genuinely want you to succeed will take you to the side and say, maybe this is something you want to do differently. Or maybe this is something you want to add on to the next time. Or, you know, I have, do you want me to take a look at your work? Or here's some suggestions. I, I can tell you that one of the best things that has ever happened is networking with people who um, just generally want you to do well. Um, that's probably been one of my biggest things develop, <laughs> developmentally. And also, um, when I feel like I've mastered something, trying something else. So when I feel like, oh, I've got this magazine thing down pat, I've got a bunch of stories that I've already done, now I need to do something in television. Or I think I, I have some storytelling done, you know, that down pat in television. Now I want to see what the web is like. It's utilizing the curiosity that's natural as a journalist and applying it to your life. I've always competed with myself. I like to see what I'm made of. I like to challenge myself. That's how you grow. That's how you become good. That's how people recognize you've got skills and they can utilize you in so many different areas. That's how you make sure you don't, you're not ever in a box. You know, by developing yourself and being consistent about that, saying I can cover black media, I can cover women's media, I can cover children's media, I can do this, 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 and that. And you know how? Because I've already done it. And I'm continuing to try different things. So that's probably one of the, the things that I like most about myself is that I don't, um, I don't like to be bored. I like to try different things. What does it mean to be a strong woman for me? Uh, it's... What it means to be a strong woman is to be vulnerable, to say, I don't know something. Can you help me? <laughs> um, it is to raise my hand even when I'm nervous and I'm scared and I don't, you know, I don't have all the right words, um, but I have a desire to know something. Um, it is to say, I need help. Um, because often I do. I mean, I'm a mother of, I'm a single mom, number one. So there's no father active in my son's life. I have moved from where I lived in New York, which was someplace that I really, really loved, um, to be close to my parents in Virginia because they are both retired and they are both hands open for myself and my son. Um, it took a lot of strength to do that because it's vulnerability. It's leaving some place that I've known for a long time and saying the most important thing for me in my life now is my child and his success in this world. And um, it is saying, I need help. Um, my son is sick. He's at home, he has a fever. My mother was probably up with him um, a lot of last night. And it took a lot of trust to, you know, I mean, not to say that your parents, you know, and your family, your support system, that they don't, of course, want to give you everything, but it's, it's nerve wracking. It's a little scary to leave your small child to go halfway around the country. Around so, the world. Around the world, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so to be a strong woman, again, is vulnerability, it's trust, it's having faith, it is saying, I need help. It is saying, show me, teach me. Um, and those are the things that, um, that I think that continue to like cultivate you as a person and as a woman. Okay, fantastic. Can we, okay, we have a question back here. Where Can we send the microphone back? Yeah. And then we'll come here. Somebody has, okay. Thank you. And my first question is especially on have you ever published a book in your life? Have I? Have you published books? Do you have any books that are published? Yes or I, Actually, I don't. Okay, the question is, how, do I have any published books? I So I have been published in books. 
I have essays in books. I have uh, been hired to write books, but I have not actually written a book as of yet. Okay. Second question, are you ghostwriter? Ghostwriter. Yeah. Are you, Am you I a ghostwriter? Yes. Yeah. So if you have such experience, tell us for who you are writing such books or any articles as a ghostwriter. Sure. So he asked, uh, I, I want to say this is the way what you're saying. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, how is it that you're a ghostwriter? In what ways in which you're a ghostwriter? Okay. Um, so as a, so a ghostwriter, does anyone know? Does everyone know what a ghostwriter is? Okay, so a ghostwriter is someone that, uh, someone who's maybe famous um, or uh, just does not have formal training as a writer or a journalist, they hire you to tell their story. And it could be done in different mediums, different ways. It could be done as a author of a book, like Hillary's done a lot of ghostwriting for celebrities, for instance, doing uh, writing books. It could be a ghostwriter for someone who um, needs you to write articles for them for the newspaper or websites or that sort of thing. It could be someone who needs you to write ma um, materials for them, speeches that they're going to give in front of an audience. Um, there's many different ways in which you can be utilized as a ghostwriter. Uh, I work as a ghostwriter. I've, I've worked as a ghostwriter for celebrities. Um, on BET, for instance, I, I, there's a show called uh, Black Girls Rock, which is um, a show that I love because it's all about the empowerment of black women and girls. And um, so I wrote scripts for different celebrities that were participating in that show. But I've also done them ghostwritten or writ written scripts that uh, for like Queen Latifah and Puff Daddy and other stars too, um, within the context of television. Uh, within the context of newspapers, I have, usually you don't talk about who it is that you're, sometimes you don't talk about who it is you're writing for. Because as a ghost, you're not the one with your, with your name on the byline, it's, it's the celebrity. So I have written on behalf of uh, civil rights activists, I've written on behalf of, uh, well, I can tell you, Marcus Samuelson is someone I used to write a column for, <laughs> and um, uh, the chef um, on a, in a magazine. You, you all know who he is, right? He's an Ethiopian He's a, chef. Yeah, mm -hmm. celebrity in chef. In the US, mm -hmm. Marcus Samuelson. Yes, um, as well as uh, political figures. Um, they So, just different different people who, who want your help in putting together their messaging or um, writing on their behalf, writing about different things that they want to talk about. So that's that's how it has worked for me as a ghostwriter. I mean, I'm a journalist by trade, uh, but I'm a mother first. Um, so, you know, there is a big challenge in terms of the day-to-day -day sort of like making sure that you can balance your work as well as what you do, but that's kind of how it is for professional women all throughout the world. Um, and so in that way, uh, I, and most of the time when I'm at home, I, I work from home. So my son is with me a lot of the time. Uh, it's, uh, and so like, you know, there's a, I have to balance, you know, um, in the mornings, I'll get up, take care of him, you know, make him food. Uh, sometimes he goes to daycare, which is like five minutes away. I make dinner, I write a story, I do an interview, I bring him home, we play, bathe him, put him to bed. When he goes to bed, I do writing. So it's a constant balancing. I was born to do both, you know? And that's the wonderful thing about being a woman in the 21st century. You don't have to decide. You can be both. Um, and that's something I'm very proud of um, because it takes a lot of work, a lot more work than when I was by myself, but I just work harder to make it work. One of the best gifts I think I can give my child is to be a happy person, a happy woman. Show him what it is to not abandon myself, not give up on my dreams, but make them a part of his experience as well. 
You know, one of the things I'm looking forward to is when he's a little bit older, him traveling with me. Um, I, he's too young right now, I think. You know, and I don't, when I don't know some place, I like to keep him safe in an environment that I know. He knows everything, he knows everyone, he's comfortable and happy. As he gets a little bit older, he'll be on these adventures with me. And one of the things that I love most about my parents and the upbringing they gave me, and this very much includes my mother, was they involved us in every part of their lives. So my dad being in the army, we would move around. They made sure we traveled. To be able to see some of the world as a small child made a huge impact on me as a person, especially as a black person, especially as a woman. I learned you can do so many things, so much more than what your immediate environment may tell you you can do. Um, and so one of the major gifts that I intend on giving, I, I hope my son takes away, is that he has a mother who does what she loves, who loves me, who brings me along for the journey, who can encourage me to be everything I want to be because she's been everything that she's wanted to be and can encourage him from that space. A lot of times our parents, you know, they're worried, they're scared that we're going to fail, you know, that we're not going to achieve our dreams, that we're going to, we're going to have to take the job that they took because they always, you know, their parent took it or their parent took it or their parent took it because they felt like that was the only way. The best, the best inspiration are the people right in front of you to say, I could do it if, if she did it. And so I, I will never choose. Um, they're both equally a part of me. So I enjoy giving back. Um, I have volunteered for uh, many years uh, through this organization called Harlem Live which is in New York. This is prior to me moving to Virginia. Um, and that involves teaching kids how to become journalists, teaching them interviewing skills and that sort of thing. Um, in addition, so that's, I wish I had more time to do that because, uh, and we're, we're still in New York, that it would be something I would continue to do. But um, gosh, I have so little time <laughs> these days. Uh, activities that I do, I read, I read. Um, I read the news every day. Um, I like to throw um, like little parties with my friends. Um, just have them over for a dinner, um, for wine, that sort of thing. Um, I'm kind of new to where I live, so I'm still figuring out what's there. In New York, it was a different experience. I ran a lot. Um, but those, those are pretty much the things that, I'm, that I've been doing most recently. I love to travel, obviously. So whenever I get an opportunity to travel, that's something that I love to do as well. Um, so one of the things that I've done now for almost 13 years is I've had uh, an organization that I call Black Girls Rule. And it is comprised of black female writers, journalists, publicists, filmmakers, um, storytellers of all kinds that um, it's a Facebook group, but we also have like chapters in different cities in the US. So in New York, in DC, in Chicago, Atlanta, there's more than 200 of us. Um, and we share our work, we share our stories, we meet uh, every Christmas time for, uh, we do a holiday potluck. Um, we've done it in New York and in DC and LA. Um, and we just, it's really, a really cool group because we encourage each other a lot. Um, we find each other jobs sometimes. We share opportunities with each other about, you know, uh, uh, assignments. We hire each other. So if one person is an editor and they say, hey, we need someone to write X, Y, and Z, and it's going to pay this much money. You know, we do that for one another. Um, Hillary is a part of the group. Um, and it's just a really wonderful resource. As I talked about surrounding yourself with family, find your family, find your tribe. This is a tribe that is so awesome. I sometimes look at the women in this group and I'm just like, I know you, you guys are amazing because they are some of the most brilliant women that I've ever met. Um, and it's funny how this group came to be. Cause I actually 
I had a job I, I, I lost. I was working at MTV and uh, it just, the job didn't work out. And it was in between going from MTV to BET. And um, I started talking to a woman at BET who became my friend about how as women, sometimes we just don't feel that supported and that we have as many opportunities in, in the media as some of our white <laughs> counterparts. Um, like there's a glass ceiling, you know, being double minority, sometimes you feel that. And so the group formed as a way to support each other. And it, I mean, I, I could tell you people who have jobs because of women in the group who looked out for them. That's the kind of family you want, right? That's the kind of family that encourages you and provides opportunity. So that's something that I'm really fiercely happy about and proud of that we've been able to do that, you know, the next couple, it'll be 15 years, like a couple of years, you know, I never would have thought that it would be like this, but it's been really great. Mm -hmm.